Now, there's a confusion in modern kind of contemporary spirituality in regards to abundance and wanting. They've gotten somehow mixed up in the so-called new age, which is neither. Neither new nor an age, perhaps. (laughs) Some people have confused it and think that abundance means wanting and getting. Abundance, if you think abundantly, you'll get all the money you want. You know, you'll get a big house, you'll get a new fancy car, you'll get the splendid partner that you deserve on this earth, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? That that's supposed to be called... (laughs) Yeah, right. You do know, huh? That's supposed to be called abundance. You know what that is? That's greed. That's wanting. That's not abundance at all. And then you go out and you test it to see if you've tuned to the right state. You go and see if you can create a parking space just where you want it, you know? Right? That's not true abundance. Because it's connected with things. And trying to get or possess things. True abundance and true generosity is a thing of the spirit. It has nothing to do with the outer things at all. So it's not to be confused with wanting. Abundance, again, non-greed, this capacity of dana, is also not weak or to be confused with just things that are beautiful, with crystals and love and light and, and uh, you know, the age of Aquarius or whatever it happens to be. That's not abundance either. That's kind of being naive or starry-eyed in some way. And it's a nice story. I mean, as the Grimm's brothers go, it's one of the more light stories, but it's, a, it's an okay story. But it's not abundance. <laughs> To experience true abundance, we must also touch the capacity to face the dark, to face the shadow of life, to face death, to look at the end of things since everything ends, to look at that, to face loss and change and selfishness and fear and know it for what it is. It's like Suzuki Roshi dying and saying, if when I die, if I suffer, that's all right, you know, that's just suffering, Buddha. That's a kind of abundance. I can suffer and that's all right. It's the capacity to face injustice and to respond to it. That's a kind of abundance that we will, we will see the injustice and have that capacity to face it and to respond, as Martin Luther King did again in almost the same phrase as Suzuki Roshi. He said, we will soon wear you down with our capacity to suffer. We're so unafraid of the dark and the suffering that we will triumph because of that abundance of spirit. That's a kind of inner abundance. And it's our capacity to face the music, to call a spade a spade, a rat a rat, a turkey a turkey, right? (laughs) A monkey a monkey, would you believe? We used to call the Defense Department the War Department. I like that much better. Before Newspeak took over and our missiles were named peacekeeping missiles and (laughs) things like that. There's a kind of abundance of spirit that faces even Stalin or Hitler or the starvation in the world and says, I see it and I will respond to this. I have this capacity. Do you understand that abundance is a very deep thing? Abundance of spirit. So it's not to be confused with wanting. Wanting a car or long life or a great partner or a hot tub or a parking space. That's not abundance. Nor is it to be confused with fear or light, just everything beautiful. Not the fear of change or of death or of the darkness. It's really an abundance of the heart. There's an African proverb that says, It's the heart that lets go 
The fingers merely follow. In our actions, it comes from within us. My colleague in teaching and friend, uh, Joseph Goldstein, practiced for a lot of years in India, much of the time while I was in Thailand and Burmese monasteries. And at some point during his years of practice in Asia, he got his mother to come over and visit and stay with him in this village, Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha was enlightened in the province of Bihar in northern India. It's a very poor area of India. And this village has a lot of different Buddhist temples in it. Mostly you walk around. There's a small marketplace and so forth. And she went to visit him in the early 70s. Never had been to a place like India. Nobody ever has, for that matter, until you go to India. There's nothing quite like it. And she was used, as you can imagine, most 60-year-old Americans who grew up and lived in New York, upstate New York, whatever. She was used to our kind of culture and our uh, the, the cleanliness of the food, the ease of transportation, the, the fine medical facilities, etc., that most of us experience in a big house. And she arrived, and he got a good room for her in one of the temples in Bodh Gaya, which meant first that she had her own room, that the roof did not leak, that she had a bed on it. It was just a single, very simple bed with a mattress probably that thick, which is a good Indian mattress, right? She didn't have to sleep on the floor. And it was a concrete room, concrete block, which is very fancy in India. It wasn't made of mud. Ten by ten. A chair and a small table. And she talked about spending time in that room. She stayed for a month and visited his teacher, and he showed her all around the temples and took her around. After coming from a house full of things, you know, our kitchens and dining rooms and living rooms and furniture and appliances, cars, living incredibly simply. And at first it frightened her, as you can imagine. How will I do this month? But by the end of one month there, she talked about how it was one of the happiest, if not the happiest time in her life. She lived incredibly simply. She had nothing, almost, and nothing to take care of. And what a joy that was. Abundance of the Spirit doesn't mean things, but it means discovering a kind of simplicity of our life where we're abundant in any circumstance.